Greetings again, non-Western Art Appreciation Class. I hope you're doing fantastically well as we continue on our journey around the world. Today we're going to continue on that journey in Oceania, really in the middle of the ocean where there appears to be almost nothing. Oceania's enormous size of 10,000 square miles um, in the largest ocean on Earth, Pacific Ocean, where we barely make out any of the individuals. <clears throat> and here's the Australian, the non-Eurocentric projection that shows up that we actually looked at last time. Now, as we move along today, as I mentioned last time, there are three general cultural groupings. Last time we looked at the two ends of the triangle here. We looked at Hawaii and then all the way down here at Easter Island. Today we're gonna to finish off this area of Polynesia. And note, Polynesia does go around like this. New Zealand is generally considered by expert as part of Polynesian, though their culture is slightly different. We will actually deal then and look at both Micronesia and Melanesia today, um, as well as a little bit of the, all, uh, the Aborigines in Australia itself. But no, Australia and the Aborigines are actually technically not considered part of Oceania. It's this large area that shows up. And one of the most exciting trips you can ever take in the world is to Papua New Guinea, this area right here, which I can't wait to actually share a month in August in Papua New Guinea. There's all sorts of different festivals. I've never been, but it's one of my dream trips in the future. And I love to travel. Now, as today, we're going to be talking about New Zealand and the Maori. They're right here in New Zealand. Let's watch actually about their creation myth. The nothing. From Takoya came Tempo, the night. There were many nights. The last night joined with space, and there came into being two thoughts. These thoughts were called Rani, the Sky Father, and Papa, the Earth Mother. They were so much in love that they held each other tightly and refused to let go of each other. Thus, the sky and the earth were joined solidly together. There was no light on the earth, as Rani and Papa's tight embrace prevented it. There was not even enough room for time to slip between them. Papa and Rani gave birth to over 100 children. Some of the children were Tangaroa, god of the sea, Tane, god of the forest, Tumatuenga, god of war, Firu, god of darkness, and Tafirimatua, god of the winds. They were all trapped between their parents and could hardly move. The children talked about what they should do. Tane suggested that he would separate the parents. Firu was angry with Tane because he was the eldest and he should be the one to do this. Tafiri wanted their parents to be left alone. Tumatoenga thought they should just kill the parents. But in the end, most of the children agreed that Tane should push them apart. Tane, god of the forest, carried four poles with him. He placed one of the poles by his parents' legs and one by their heads. He then pushed his parents apart. He pushed for years and years. Rani, the sky, and Papa, the earth, were separated and became the sky above and the earth below as we know them today. The blood from Rani became the red of the sunset. The blood from Papa became the red clay earth. Light came into the world at last. The children moved to the four corners. But Tafiri was very angry with what had been done. The anger grew in him until he couldn't bear it anymore. Tafiri ripped them his legs and threw them into the heavens, where they turned into the first two stars. He then turned his blind fury on all of his brothers. He blew hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones. He made tsunamis and huge storms. His anger had no end. Papa and Rani were unhappy. They missed each other so much that they cried and cried and cried. Rani's tears became the rivers and oceans and dew on the grass. The mists that rise from the ground are from Papa, 
time with loneliness. And so one of the things that's interesting about this is note how they try to explain darkness and light as well as the natural formations that show up. Same, the same way the Hawaiian creation myth is about the idea of kind of building this, this darkness and actually expanding the light that shows up between the children. So ultimately when we look at a Maori men's meeting house called a marae in New Zealand, that's what this myth is actually what we're going to see. So public debates take place in front of the sacred house. And this is traditionally a men's ceremonial meeting house. Women were not allowed in. That has actually changed today and most women are allowed in these, these meeting houses, but that is really a recent phenomenon. This was for a place for men to make decisions. Now, they would have public forums where women's voices could be heard on the exterior before they went inside the ancestor. This is always an ancestral house that's represented. So the, re the rituals here reinforce good relationships between the visible world and the less visible world. Remember that visible world, the world we live in, less visible world, the world of the ancestors and the gods behind me. Now, as we look at this, this individual, this is literally a layout, an abstraction of an actual real ancestor. So on the Maori Morai, what we end up with is an ancestor here. So the going behind the ancestor, so down the spine line, is going to be the backbone. And note, there's a ridge pole to help actually support the backbone. In fact, there's going to be two ridge poles, one by the head and one by the feet. So Tani can actually push Earth Mother and Sky Father apart from one another. The slanting barge boards are going to be in the embracing arms of the ancestor. We're going to have the ancestor's face right here. The rafters then that go back are going to be the rib cage that shows up. The window here is his eye, and the door is the mouth of the ancestor. So Earth Mother, Papatuanuka, down here, and the house darkens as you enter, kind of like the journey from life to death, like the ancestors, because there's not a lot of light or windows besides the window eye and the door mouth. Today we put modern electricity into it. Uh, they didn't used to have that, obviously. Um, and so it really is the ancestral face that comes out here, always of a powerful ancestor. Now, as we look at different versions of this, to Maori then, all art originates in the less visible world, the world of the ancestors and the gods. That's where beauty resides. And as such, artists' job is to bring out that, that beauty, that power, that mana, that energy into the world where we live so we can govern it. So these marae, these Maori men's meeting houses are ceremonial centers where images of the god from the less visible world so we can honor them are actually in, a, in our world. So this marae honors the son of a legendary, right here, that would be the main character, of a legendary white whaler and Maori woman, and her name was Ruata Papuke. Now, as you go in, um, you can actually see, here is the eye, here is the mouth of the ancestor, and the inside is elaborately decorated. It used to be earthen floors, and even today, it's mostly kind of wood floors, wood of natural materials, rather than concrete, and so you really have the feel of the earth that shows up here. You're going to have these ridge poles. Note that we talked about the ridge poles basically being support structures like Tane, the god, um, putting them apart. And so you'll see Maori scarification actually all over the beautiful image on the inside. Every scarification pattern is unique because they either represent ancestors or they represent gods that show up. And so what do you already know of the interior based upon what we've covered both from um, Polynesian art, Oceania art, art before, but also then from the video on creation. Well, we have those open eyes and mouth. You can look at the different mouth shapes on aggressive. Ah, the idea of the tongue sticking out and teeth is aggressive posture. And remember, only men are allowed in here. Now, women do, quote unquote, get to get in here. And that's because women make the beautiful platforms that are over here that are actually the roof line of the fibers. They don't go into it to place it. They place it on the outside. So they, on some level, it's the idea they can look in on men's world. Now, of course, this has changed in recent phenomena. So here's how they work. So orators, the people who are actually speaking, would even address the house as a living person during speeches. Say, ah, oh, the great ancestors. And they would point to different barge boards. These are barge boards over here, these posts. And say, ah, oh, do you remember Ruta Pupuke's father, Omanakasa? and they would actually talk to them. The large heads for the Maori <coughs> are a symbol of intelligence. The ancestors are actually supporting the house. That's what actually props it up. There are often war dance gestures that they're doing here. 
And the woven um, panels up here, as I mentioned, are done by women. It's very bright and beautiful because the finished carvings are always oiled down with a combo of red clay. Remember that red clay from father and the shark liver oil to produce a very rich reddish brown color that's very highly lustrous here. Um, the tongue out, when we do see it, we see aggression. And you must remove shoes before entering. It's really, you're stepping onto the earth. So you leave your shoes right outside here. So you keep the dust and the dirt off, almost as a purification ritual as you're going through a, a tarana in Japanese culture. So the mana, the energy of the ancestors is believed to reside inside the meeting house. And as I said, women used to not be allowed here, but we changed that today. So each woven pattern that is done by the women on the inside, it has a symbolic meaning. So if we see these chevrons, this idea of these almost diamond-like shapes that show up, those are representation of the monster Tasha. If we have see steps, so do I see these steps? Steps would be like this going up. I don't see any of those here. Those are generally heaven stairs climbed by the hero god Tashaki. Diamonds. Um, where we're saying, so here's our chevrons for the monster. Do I see any diamonds? I don't see any diamonds. So diamonds represent the flounder. And the scroll patterns, those patterns that we see with waves, we've seen this in Maori, our in Polynesian tattooing process, these are going to be the ideas of water waves and control over water and traveling. And here we have shark teeth that show up. And so each one of them represents something else. Note here with the tongue out, that's an aggressive posture showing that that's someone who's actually protecting over and scaring. And here's what the inside looks like. Note, with the first ancestor always being Tane, the individual who actually pushed um, Earth Mother, Sky Father apart from one another. And so with the barge boards that go all the way down here. Note the white that you can actually see, the glistening eyes. When you walk in, it's a little eerie because they're always staring at you. And even a small amount of light will make them glisten. So Earth Mother, here, Papatanuka and Sky Father Amranganui embraced too tightly for Earth to form, as we saw. Their son Tane, that first sculpture, rests them apart and holds them apart for eternity. <clears throat> and that's what creates our visible world from the less visible world. Now, as this aggressive posture, you may know about this, it's something called the Haka dance. So men and women both perform this sacred dance. And so this is a Maori Haka warriors dance. And so it's danced particularly in front of very famous kind of events and sporting events. It's meant as a cultural celebration. And as long as it's actually done appropriately and by people of Maori New Zealand, it's allowed. Problem is many other individuals have decided to take this on. Now BYU, Brigham Young University, supposedly got in trouble by the um, NCAA for making fun of this religious ritual. Turns out the BYU football team had a New Zealander, a Maori, um, on their team and he actually taught them the steps and here's what it looks like it's about an aggressive dance meant to scare you so that you are afraid or you ever fall to people. and remember we do have some female warriors so it's not common within Maori note the wide open eyes In the ancient tradition, and of course, this is the psych up culture for your own individual, and the psych out, like you listen to psych music or, or really upbeat music or a song you love when you go to work out. Imagine trying to do that before war. And so that's what the haka dance actually represents, then, the idea. Now, recently, we've had different companies get in trouble because they want to use different aspects of the Polynesian uncultured, particularly the Maori which is the bionicle, this is the hunga. So when the problem becomes is that when is cultural appropriation allowed? What is cultural appropriation? And 
is it an okay? Uh, the idea of Maori, the Taunga is actually their priest. So by calling something Taunga, we run into the same issue. Um, recently, Kim Kardashian had some of the same issues. She was actually calling her product line without even thinking about it. Um, and someone on her team should have helped her out with this. And she called it kimono. Kind of, and that there is a particular historic reference of a kimono and what it means in terms of Japanese culture. And so this on some level was cultural appropriation in terms of wording. So she meant nothing in terms of offending anyone, um, just didn't think about the words at different aspects. For example, if we were gonna call a brand name of um, let's say dish detergent or a brand name of uh, nails and another called culture called the brand name of nails um, Christ nails we would all be mortally offended even though they might not mean anything about it they just like the name Christ or the name Jesus and it happens to be a nail company to our associations that's often what happens it's innocence and it's naivete in many kinds but it can be harmful to a culture who thinks that you're trying to belittle their culture and on some level you might be belittling their culture without even recognizing it. So that's a conversation we need to have, the difference between when you can use a cultural symbol and when you can't. Are there certain cultural symbols that are allowed to be used and others you should never use? Um, and does it change over time? Um, do we need the individual support of that particular culture before we use it? And what do we do if that culture is no longer existent? Can we then use anything that we want? And so is it a matter of useful, allowable, moral, respectful. This is a difficult conversation. As we move forward, we say, all right, well, what we did 10 years ago was not respectful. So I'm very proud of the work that I got to do on Moana. There are some errors in Moana um, for kind of cultural license that showed up that we can talk about um, in class and, or you can find videos online that show up. In 10 years, will Moana still hold up as being culturally relevant because um, Disney, the Walt Disney World Company, very much worked with local individuals as members of the Oceanic Trust and academics to make sure that it was as accurate as possible. And that is an issue that we will basically wait to see as we develop cultural relativism in the future and cultural appropriation. And that's one of the challenges here. Now, continuing on, we're going to start looking then at some different aspects of wonderful cultures, but many of these cultures are more in the Melanesian phase. So when we get to New, New Guinea or New Ireland, they are farther along on the map. So they're no longer in our triangular grouping that shows up with Hawaii, with New Zealand, and with the Easter Islands, that larger. They're just outside of it in New Guinea on a much larger land mass that is a forest, basically rainforest. And so there's a number of different um, environments from um, volcanoes to rainforest to sandy beaches to mountains. And so they're going to have a plethora of material that can make from. This is actually what's called the Malangan Mortuary Ceremony. One of the more elaborate mortuary ceremonies of anywhere on the planet in the modern day world. Malangan ceremonies are basically, they end up being very large scale festivals. And they often require more than a year's prep. So they don't happen every year. The rites are basically a critical transition from the soul of the living to the realm of the dead. And we need that ceremony to help them with that transition phase. They always honor recent death. And so if you've died in the last three or four years, the Malagan will be for you as well. But it's a community celebration, particularly in the modern day world, when a lot of individuals who would celebrate Malagan New Guinea, many of them have become Christian. But they still believe in the, manga, the Malagan and the idea of ancestral worship. It's also used to educate their youth almost as a way of doing um, initiations, almost like a bush camp that we'll talk about in Africa where you remove male children and female children from the family as young teenagers or even younger, right before they hit teenage, to teach them how to be a man or how to be a woman in the society. And sometimes that, that removal can take anywhere from a few days, a few weekends, or it might actually be six to eight weeks. It used to be up to a year and a half in different parts of the world. And so this is kind of the initiation of young men. Women also go through this initiation as well. The most famous part of Malangan is when young boys learn how to dance the, the Tatanula mask from a boys initiation ceremony that shows up. And you can see these beautiful masks that show up. And then you, they hide the face. And a lot, of, a lot of mask traditions around the world hide the face so you really don't know who the individual is that's dancing. They become more of an ancestor, more of a spirit, more of an embodiment of the cultural mores. And so here's what the Tatanula dance of Malagan actually, actually looks like. So 
just generally rituals beforehand to prepare you to take on a spirit if you are a master aid dancer. You're generally accompanied by many older men that actually help you. But some masks just get carried in this sense because they represent different ancestral lineages. And other individuals, the young men or the older men, will actually wear these. The beautiful yellow feather work here actually is supposed to represent a male headdress in the ancient world. And then we have circles and waves, note, with a boat coming out of it. So this would be part of the funeral celebration, celebrating the life of the individuals who have died. It doesn't always, funerals don't always have to be sad um, experiences. It can be a celebration of life, kind of like an Irish lake. That's kind of what I want in my film, celebrate what I did and all the experiences I've had in the world, rather than the sadness. But then we want to show you the dance of the individual. So boys are taught in initiation, generally how to dance, and the ritual steps here. So everything you're looking at is ritually prepared. Boys are prepared to dance. It's young men. Older men will also dance the masks for the ancestors. The gemini are covered up, so it's actually a spirit that is dancing rather than you. So the perfection is on the spirit. So you practice your body so you can actually do this in your sleep. There are very much ritual movements that show up. And if a malagon is not going on, you might practice the different steps. The music is almost always live and tied in with what you're looking at. And today you can actually see there's sponsorships like we have in the modern day world. So here's Coca-Cola Real Refreshment. And the other thing that shows up within the masquerade tradition itself is that um, if there's not a Malagon going on, if you're a tourist, you can actually go and ask someone to dance the masquerade so you can see and get a feel of what the tradition looks like. Very similar to going to a luau today without the ritual kind where you go with your family and you see a fire and dance. So, um, that's put on all over part of music. Almost none of them have the ritual made on the beach, sit on the sand, um, reflect upon men and women, how we came together. That was the original Luau, established by King and Kamehameha the second, and he broke the tattoo of Luau, men and women, and their monotonous. You can see there's multiple different types of masquerades. They're all called Malagan and Tantanua. And they have various symbols now, many that we've seen before. You'll see circles with spirals for waves and crests. You'll see individuals with five gold outs here, representation of mankind, right? Various flowers show up. A lot with individuals sticking tongues out or birds and fish emerging, right? That the ancestors have control both over the oceans and over the skies. So you see multiple different images. We also notice it's almost always men that dance masquerades. Very few traditions, even today, allow women to dance around the planet. And so, this is a Malagon mortuary ceremony. This one that we just watched was from New Ireland. You can go back and watch the whole thing if you like, but it's also from New Guinea. And you can see the different variations of masks that show up. Now, most masks are worn in dances 
rather than um, display. So most masquerades are worn and then displayed later on. And traditionally, all artworks would have been bull burnt at the conclusion of the event. So if you go to a museum, we don't have a lot of these masquerades today, unless they've been made specifically for sale in the tourist industry. Um, just because they're normally burnt, there's a religious aspect, really making them part of the ancestral world. In modern times, though, most are now retained as the carving tradition is only known by a few people, as I'll show you in a moment. There's very few master carvers that are left, which poses a problem because that means you can't make any new masks or you have to hire someone from outside of the culture to make those new masks. A lot of youth culture don't want to actually continue on this tradition. They'd rather live more Western lifestyles. And so it's an interesting kind of dynamic that we see here and around the world. So one of the master Malangan carvers is a man, man up here, Ben Sissia. And so he specifically focuses and believes in Tatanula masks as ancestral spirits. That's his specialty. He believes that the ancestral masks, as do the other individuals in New Ireland, that's constructed of accumulated mana. You take wood, which has mana. You take feathers or hair, which has mana. You take senate, which has mana. You take paint, which has mana. You take symbols, which have mana. And you put it all together, it increases the mana of the person who's actually wearing the mask. So while you're there, you're almost a superhuman. You become an ancestor or a god. The inside is Ill inlaid, you can see here, with snail shell, so it's very difficult to see out of. And that is generally um, done with a snail opercula eyes, the shell. They're generally painted black, white, yellow, and red. And those are symbols of black is for black magic. White um, is for the end of warfare. Um, yellow and red are for violence and warfare. And finally, the Tatanula masks are almost always stored for future use now. They used to be burned, but with the dying tradition, it makes it very difficult. Another master Malangan carver are a father and son, and this is traditionally how the, the masquerade and how the carving tradition would have got passed on. So this is Edward and son Michael Sale, and you can see here that hopefully his son will continue on within the tradition, but if he doesn't, his tradition slowly dies because there might be only one or two carvers in each village. Now, as we leave Micronesia a little bit, um, or I'm sorry, as we were kind of talking about Melanesia, let's give you some features of Melanesia that are different then, and some similar to Polynesia. Oh. Oh, woo, woo. No good.